three gallons of milk, red onions, oh, sorry, grocery list. There we go. The next course in our Nobel meal will be delivered by Paul Thompson. Currently the W.K. Kellogg Chair in Agricultural Food and Community Ethics at Michigan State University, Dr. Thompson earned a bachelor's degree, Bachelor of Arts degree in philosophy from Emory University in 1974. In 1979, he completed a Master of Arts in Philosophy at State University of New York at Stony Brook. Continuing at that institution, he earned a doctorate in the philosophy of technology in 1980. Joining the faculty at Texas A&M University in 1981, he shared his efforts between the philosophy and agricultural economics department. In 1982, he was appointed the Texas A&M's Center for Science and Technology Policy and Ethics. During his tenure at A Texas A&M, Dr. Thompson was the author, co-author, or editor of seven books, seven books, including Sacred Cows and Hot Potatoes agrarian myths and policy realities, which received the American Agricultural Economics Association Award for Professional Excellence in Communication, the second time he had won that award. By now, you've probably noticed a pattern. In Paul Thompson, we have a speaker who expertly applies his philosophy experience to ethical problems related to food and agriculture. After assuming a dis distinguished professorship in philosophy at Purdue's University in 1999, he continued that pattern when he became the director of Purdue's Center for Food, Animal Productivity, and Well-Being, stepping into the contentious and, shall we say, mucky issues of animal welfare and agriculture. Even while focused on that specific and challenging ethical issue, Paul also maintained his philosophical foundations. Paul was co at Purdue, Paul was co-editor of the Agrarian Roots of Pragmatism, which explored oft-ignored connections between the philosophical, philosophical movement of pragmatism and agrarianism. During that same time period, he was also part of a group that produced a natural, National Research Council report entitled Environmental Effects of Transgenic Plants, the Scope and Adequacy of Regulation. The juxtaposition of those two, latter two publications exemplifies we have, why we have invited Paul Thompson to join us for this Making Food Good Nobel Conference. While firmly grounded in history, literature, and the intellectual traditions of philosophy and ethics, Dr. Thompson is also willing to focus those capacities on the thorny issues raised by biology, biotechnology and more recently nanotechnology. Each year our Nobel Conference explicitly recognizes ethical arguments surrounding food and agriculture trying to help us reflect on ethical and spiritual issues connected with the chosen topic. Since our title this year, Making Food Good, very consciously recognizes value judgments, Paul's robust scholarship and thoughtful reflections about food and agricultural issues is a welcome complement to this conference. Our speakers have addressed issues from environmental preservation to food taste and quality and socioeconomic issues and international development, and all these have been the focus of Dr. Thompson's deliberate and reasoned ethical analysis. But despite knowing that our speakers bring a wealth of experience and achievement with them, we are often surprised by the extras that we didn't expect. Thoughtful, deliberative, intellectually thorough, and honest. We expected all of these when we invited Paul Thompson. But when a speaker preparing to address a large public audience submits the title, What is Good Food? An Argument with My Wife, we wonder if we've gotten more than we bargained for. Thoughtful, deliberative, thorough, and honest, but also daring and a bit edgy. I would note also that on his blog, he states a desire someday to open a restaurant with the title Fat Elvis. Given the focus on the fat part in this conference, there are a bunch of questions that come to mind. But Paul will be able to explain that and the contradiction in his title. But 
Perhaps he's already laid the groundwork for that in this insightful snippet from, his rec from a recent blog entry. In that post, he laments the narrow vision of a recent conference, not ours, thank you, on food and agricultural ethics. Dr. Thompson wrote, the speakers had completely lost sight of the fact that food has an experiential meaning, that eating constitutes a temporal period of a given person's life. Food security is indeed a key theme for food ethics, but we should never adopt the notion that security reduces only to calories and nutrients. Food is experience, experience is being, and any ethical response to hunger must find some way to acknowledge that. Dr. Thompson, we welcome you to the Nobel Conference podium. Thank you for sharing your experience with food. Ah, good. So, thank you, Jim. And you'll notice on the slide uh, that there's actually been a change in my title. Uh, and that's due to the fact that my wife is here. <laughs> my wife, Diane, is a local food activist and uh, uh, is very active in community garden work, uh, works with a school garden in our neighborhood uh, once a week, working with uh, elementary school kids, um, teaching them about food, teaching them what's healthy to eat, and also taking them out and uh, working in a garden that's outside. And she's also been uh, active in uh, developing a number of community-supported ag programs and working with uh, local farmers markets. So uh, while uh, I only think about food, she actually does something about it. Um, some of you, uh, I'm very pleased to be here talking about ethics, but some of you may be wondering um, what a philosopher is and what a philosopher would have to say about ethics. And so uh, in order to give you some familiarity with that, I, I want you to just think of someone who really wanted to go into the ministry, wanted to be a pastor or a priest, uh, and wanted to do that so that they could tell everybody how they ought to live their lives, but just really couldn't bear the burden of being a moral example themselves. So I am going to uh, go back to my blog a little bit which is, uh, and, and read a little section from this argument or conversation uh, with Diane. Uh, and I think in some respects it recapitulates many of the things that we've been talking about uh, in the conference. Um, so this will just take a second of reading. A while back, my wife Diane presented a sack to me that our newspaper carrier had left for canned goods so that we can donate to a local food drive. What do you want to give, she asks. I rumble through our rather limited stock of canned items and my hand moves quickly to some condensed milk that I know has been sitting there for some time. Diane looks at the can, noticing a best buy date of December 2008. This particular exhibit uh, episode's happening in May of 2009. She points out the date, but I am not dissuaded. At this point, she berates me for thinking that I can dispose of outdated food items by pawning them off on needy people. Now, my immediate response is defensive. That's perfectly good food, I say. I would eat it, and I would feed it to my children. The can of milk is, in fact, there because it is an ingredient in the public pies that are favored by my son, Walker. I go on to point out that canned goods can remain quite safe to eat for many years, even decades, especially when they show no signs of deformity, rust, or any, any other breach of integrity. The condensed milk, I should add, looks to be in pristine condition. I note that food pantries routinely receive items from grocery stores that have passed their sell-by dates, but that are still within the margin of time for safe use. For canned items, the use date may be a year or two after the product needs to be removed from the grocery store shelf. These points are batted back and forth between us for a while. Diane is still skeptical. Why are those dates there if they don't mean what they say, she asks. I reiterate the point about margins of safety and the difference between a sell-by and a safe use date. I also note that these are not even sell-by dates, but, quote, best-by dates. How would I be supposed to know that if I were in a food pantry looking for something to feed my family, she retorts. I reply that this is not esoteric knowledge that only I know because of my professional work on food. It's something I learned growing up. But by now, I'm actually coming around to her point of view. I disrespect the eventual recipients of these items if I pick something that can be questioned in the way that Diane is now doing. The condensed milk goes back on the shelf, eventually to become a pie for my son, 
while a can of spinach, well within its Best Buy date, goes into the bag. Those of you who happened to go to the concert last night have some thoughts about cans of spinach. But, uh, and, and Diane has asked me to say that, that I was the one that bought the can of spinach, not her, just in order. So, oddly, however, Diane is now taking my point. Isn't there an ethical problem here, she asks, if we are wasting perfectly good food simply because the food companies have incorporated these margins of safety into their labels? They have an economic interest in selling more food, after all, while the public interest here should be geared toward getting food to needy people. Our conversation has now become more philosophical as we recognize that the tension between these conflicting notions of good food. The outdated milk is perfectly good food in the sense that it is safe to eat. What is more, one influential idea that it has it that canned milk is particularly good food. My hand had gone to it partly because of conditioning from my youth that places items like condensed or dry milk into the good food category. Even though if it weren't for pies, we would hardly ever use these items around my house today. Such considerations have been working in the back of my mind as I switch my ground, coming to a different notion of good food, one that's actually closer to my daily practice. So now we send lots of fresh tomatoes to the food bank, but I won't promise that the now out-of-date can of pumpkin pie filling that's in the cupboard won't go into the bag the next time that there's a newspaper carry carrier food can drive. So what I want to do in the first part of my talk is to really just cover some ground that's been collectively covered by all of our speakers. It's really just to move through a quick inventory of some of the ways that we can understand uh, food to be good. And, uh, taking the, the cue from the conversation that Diane and I had, we might start out with the idea that good food is safe food. Uh, certainly this is one of the ways uh, that we understand uh, food to be good, and it was the, probably the front of mind consideration in our, in our conversation. Uh, even here, though, it's possible to take uh, different points of view and to understand uh, what good food is in terms of safety in very different ways. Uh, if I think about the way that my grandmother would have understood this, and one of the main things that you learn as someone trained in, in professional ethics is that you should never get too far away from whatever your grandmother thought. Uh, but, but it would have been that we would understand safety primarily in terms of the food being pure, it being fresh, and it being wholesome. And I would stress that for my grandmother, this is what it meant for the food to be safe. These are not indicators of safety. This is what safety means to my grandmother. If I pull a, a more scientific perspective into it, uh, there's really, we're, we're really looking for toxicity within the food, the ability to actually cause uh, some sort of disease or, uh, in the worst case, uh, death. And, and food safety uh, experts uh, inf understand toxicity in two primary dimensions, uh, one of which uh, is associated with microorganisms, Salmonella E. coli, uh, and another uh, that's associated with uh, chemicals that don't belong in the food. And there's actually a fairly long list of the kinds of things that can be in food uh, that would hurt you, including some things that occur naturally in food. Um, and there's a very imprecise kind of mapping uh, between this scientific way of looking at food safety and the way that my grandmother would have looked at it. Uh, we can focus on um, things like pesticides or microorganisms and say that in some sense uh, these are ways of understanding whether the food is pure or not. Uh, we can focus on things like additives. These would have been things that would have been intentionally put into the food. Uh, and uh, there we might be interested uh, in, in you know, questions of toxicity. It's really difficult to map those questions uh, onto the pure, fresh, and wholesome type of consideration. I can tell you that my grandmother uh, didn't want any of that stuff. Uh, for her, um, the purity meant that it doesn't have any additives in it. But from a scientific perspective, uh, additives that are not toxic are fine. Uh, and then there are also things that are in the food naturally or that uh, might induce allergens. Uh, that uh, we might map in terms of uh, is the food wholesome? I don't really know if that's the way that we would understand that or not. Uh, they get to be uh, very different kinds of questions. Uh, in some respects, I think we wind up uh, asking uh, not so much uh, is this good food or is this uh, safe food, but a question more like is this food at all? Uh, and certainly some of the things that we associate with wholesome food uh, in the United States are, uh, are um, 
distinctions that are not made in other parts of the world. So there are uh, many uh, grains and uh, animal products that are eaten in other parts of the world uh, that uh, we would not consider to be food. Uh, we wouldn't consider them to be wholesome. Uh, they don't have any toxic elements with them, uh, but uh, they're not considered to be uh, proper. Well, let's go on and add another uh, bit to our inventory. Something that's pretty closely related to SAFE uh, is healthy, uh, but it's not exactly the same thing. We might be talking about the wholesomeness and the, uh, the safety aspects, but we might also be interested in whether or not it's nutritious. Um, so there's a connection here between safety and healthy, uh, but it starts to mean something different, and we've heard a number of uh, presentations that talk about this dimension. Uh, we might do a similar kind of uh, little story about uh, looking at this from the scientific perspective uh, again, uh, but uh, in fact we could do that uh, with most of the elements that I'm going to look at, so I'm actually going to move on uh, and uh, try to move a little more quickly through some other aspects of my uh, inventory. Uh, obviously, in a certain sense, we think that good food is food that tastes good. Uh, we like it to be tasty. Um, we uh, might associate that with freshness or wholesomeness. Uh, and foods that uh, people who are, have been, uh, I, I think I learned a new word in terms of a, a behavioral condition taste in the last lecture, people who have uh, different uh, conditioning might think uh, uh, some things that I don't think are particularly tasty are, are quite tasty. Um, we also might ask whether the food is legal. Is this a sense in which we understand uh, food to be good? Um, I think this is a, 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 an idea that's very closely related, related to the safety criterion, particularly in the United States. Uh, in the United States, if it's, uh, if it's not uh, unsafe, uh, it's probably legal. Uh, and uh, the government uh, does not uh, really provide much of a basis for uh, banning or limiting any kind of food uh, unless there's some sort of scientifically uh, demonstrated food risk uh, that's associated with it. Um, some um, species that we don't consider uh, proper to eat, cats and dogs, I have to mention that, I'm sorry, um, uh, are not legal in the United States, but uh, the, the limitations are, are, very, uh, are very minor. But what about this other thing that came up in uh, the conversation with Diane? Uh, do we need to be respectful to others in any way uh, when we think about food? Is that an aspect of what makes food good? And perhaps we could unpack that by asking about, um, is our food just? Does it meet a criteria of justice? We might uh, unpack both of those notions in terms of asking whether or not uh, there's a certain element of uh, fairness uh, in our food system. Uh, now, these are th notions that are related to one another, respectfulness, fairness, justice, uh, and so we might actually shift over and understand uh, both the respectful and the fair category as aspects of what it means uh, for, fair for food to be just. What, what would it be to be just food? Uh, and uh, we might want to know whether or not it's legal. Legal might be a component of that. Um, uh, but in many respects, the key question is fair and respectful to whom? And here again, several things might come up. We might be interested in uh, being respectful to our friends and family, to our neighbors. Uh, we might be interested in being fair and respectful to the people that produce our food. Uh, and of course, we might be uh, interested in being fair and respectful to particularly needy people uh, who uh, don't have uh, access to either enough food or to proper food. Uh, so these kinds of questions come up. Uh, if we emphasize the friends and family and needy neighbors uh, category, we might articulate this as uh, the need for a certain kind of hospitality. This may not be uh, the most familiar word to understand this, but this idea that we have uh, uh, responsibilities to be generous, to be sharing, uh, these are the kinds of ideas that I want to uh, point out when we emphasize uh, hospitality. And we might understand this to be also associated with uh, what it means to be respectful with respect to food. Uh, and uh, we can actually uh, think of being respectful uh, in terms of uh, offering people food that we consider to be good in all of the other senses. Uh, so that we would be failing to be uh, properly hospitable if we offered food uh, to a guest or to a neighbor or to someone in need uh, that we wouldn't eat ourselves or that we didn't consider to be food that tasted good or that was proper food. Uh, and this uh, gets unpacked uh, fairly straightforwardly in terms of things like uh, religious dietary rules, 
uh, if your guest or the needy person uh, has particular uh, religious or value-based food needs, uh, it would be disrespectful not to uh, offer food to them uh, that was in cons consistent with those needs. And of course, if you know that there are certain kinds of things uh, that some people just don't like, it would be inappropriate to offer those things as well. So what about the farmers and food workers circle? How do we understand uh, fairness in those categories? Well, we might draw circles back to the fairness. We might be interested in whether or not farmers are getting a fair return on the work that they put into the growing the food. We might be interested in whether farm workers or the people that are working in slaughterhouses or in uh, the food, um, the middle part of the food industry are getting fair wages. Um, we've also, I think, had a recent idea that we can address this through thinking about whether our food systems are local. Uh, so we start to unpack uh, this notion of fairness, uh, I think, in some interesting uh, different ways. Uh, and I haven't even mentioned environment yet. We haven't gotten into any of the ways in which uh, environmental considerations uh, go into whether our food is good or not. And here we might draw some lines to other aspects of the circle. Uh, is it meet environmental regulations? Is it safe? Uh, you know, are there connections to the idea of uh, localness that might have to do with uh, food miles, the idea that you're not moving your food quite so far? Uh, long stories here to tell all of these. Uh, and if we raise this question of fair and respectful to whom uh, in the environmental arena, we may wonder whether or not we should be asking question about uh, whether our food is uh, fair to the animals that we eat or that are responsible for producing the uh, milk and eggs uh, that we consume. So we start to get a very messy picture here, and uh, in fact, um, the picture becomes uh, even messier uh, when we start throwing a bunch of other issues into the uh, um, domain. Uh, and I think my first point uh, is just to call attention to something that the conference as a whole has called attention to, uh, which is the sheer complexity of the ways in which uh, food could be uh, considered to be good. Uh, and I think I want to suggest that one of the things that we start to do when we ask questions about what would food ethics be, why would we understand uh, ethical responsibilities uh, with respect to this very messy picture, uh, is the first thing we want to do is we want to make sure all of these things are on the plate, so to speak. We want to make sure that we've served up uh, a portion for thinking about food ethics uh, that is sufficiently complex that includes all of these dimensions uh, and that we're not narrowing in uh, too closely on just one of these, uh, these pictures. Uh, now, at this point, I'm supposed to tell you uh, what food ethics uh, is and how we should proceed, uh, and unfortunately, I just can't do that. I don't know myself. Um, I think one of, another prerequisite, in addition to uh, learning from your grandmother, uh, to being a philosopher, is that it helps to be really confused about things. Um, in some respects, I think uh, uh, people who are food activists uh, have a very rich and robust sense of food ethics, and they uh, have a very strong sense of what's right. Uh, and I respect that, and I learn from it intensely, but as a philosopher, sometimes it helps to be confused. Uh, it helps to, to, to ponder that question of how we could pull all of these things together and get them on the plate uh, at one time. So what I'm going to do in the balance of my talk is to go back to some thinking I've done, not so much on food broadly, but on agriculture. Agriculture is connected to food. I think that's one of the lessons we've learned here already. Uh, and uh, suggest that uh, there are uh, two broad ways of organizing our way of thinking uh, about uh, food ethics questions that can be derived from two very different ways of understanding uh, agriculture. I call this the philosophy of agriculture. I think I'm the only person in the United States who does the philosophy of agriculture. Uh, I met uh, uh, someone from Germany who does it a couple of weeks ago, so maybe it's a coming thing, who knows. But uh, um, the idea here is what kind of underlying, almost implicit um, ideas uh, do we bring to thinking about uh, agriculture and how do we understand it to have uh, any kind of significance for our lives. Now the first of these models that I want to suggest I'm going to call uh, an industrial philosophy of agriculture. Now I want you to listen here because um, there would be a tendency to jump to a conclusion and I'm not 
talking about industrial agriculture. I'm not talking about a particular way of doing agriculture or a particular form of agriculture. I'm not talking about big farms or heavily mechanized farms. I'm talking about a way of thinking about agriculture. And the basic idea behind what I'm calling an industrial philosophy of agriculture is that agriculture is just another sector of an industrial economy. It's just like the energy sector. It's just like the healthcare sector. It's just like auto manufacturing. Or for that matter, it's just like the entertainment sector. And what we want to do when we ask and answer questions about the ethics of agriculture, what's fair and just with respect to agriculture, is that we should approach it in the same way that we approach those other sectors of, a, of the economy. And to give a fairly uh, simple statement of what that may be, we really have uh, two key ideas. Uh, we want every sector of our economy to be efficient. We want it to produce the goods that we want to consume, whether those goods are television shows and movies or gasoline or diesel fuel or health care. We want it to uh, produce that uh, in, uh, in a, as cost-effective uh, manner as possible, but we also want it to deliver the goods that we actually want. We want to be able to, to buy the things that we want. Uh, and then secondly, we want that sector to internalize costs. So you shouldn't be getting efficient, you shouldn't be uh, getting cheaper or more cost effective by imposing costs on somebody else. Um, uh, in particular, in agriculture, one of the issues is imposing costs on future generations. But uh, you shouldn't be, um, you know, it, it, you have a false efficiency uh, if you haven't uh, uh, taken all of the possible cost efficiencies into account. So what does this mean from an ethics standpoint? Well, being efficient is uh, uh, the central norm of a tradition in ethics that we call uh, utilitarianism. I think in common language we use the word utilitarian to mean kind of boring and useful. Uh, in philosophy, it's an approach that really focuses on outcomes and what you want is you want to uh, produce the outcomes that uh, deliver the greatest good for the greatest number of people. When you're doing that, you're acting in an efficient manner. If you apply this uh, norm fairly straightforwardly, uh, if you actually reduce the number of people in agriculture, uh, reduce the number of farms, you may be doing something good uh, because it means that they can go work in the energy sector or they can work in the entertainment sector or the healthcare sector. Uh, from a utilitarian perspective, the long history of agriculture, which has uh, involved uh, smaller and smaller percentages of people working in agriculture, uh, is actually a good thing. Uh, whenever you lower the cost of food, you actually get an additional benefit from this perspective, because while, you know, when you lower the cost of, uh, of television programs or movies that you rent on DVDs or download off the internet, now that's a good thing, right? You have more money, to spend, money, more money to spend on other things. But lowering the cost of food is particularly good because spending money on food is more important to poor people than it is to uh, rich people. So of all of the things that you could lower the cost of, lowering the cost of food from a utilitarian perspective has got to be one of the very best things that you could do because it benefits uh, the poor people uh, more than it uh, benefits the rich. That's my point here. But, there's always a but, efficiency has social costs, right? Um, if you're reducing the number of farmers, you better hope that there are other jobs that they can go to. They, they, the, the economy needs to be growing, there need to be uh, other things for them to do. Um, and uh, so, uh, this general utilitarian norm uh, is that uh, uh, as long as the benefits are outweighing the costs, something can be ethically justified, uh, and sometimes social costs uh, can be ethically justified uh, when they're outweighed by social benefits. Uh, but we do need to understand this whole cost-benefit weighing uh, as operating within certain kinds of ethical constraints, and this is where we get to the internalized cost principle, right? We always achieve any efficiencies with respect to certain background rules and regulations, and these are going to frame the trade-offs that people are willing to make. If I'm very, very rich, I'm willing to pay a lot of money 
uh, for um, uh, something that a poor person uh, might not be willing to pay for. And one of the most pointed cases here is that if I'm very, very rich, I'm willing to pay uh, um, six dollars uh, to take uh, a couple of bushels of corn and turn them into uh, fuel that I can uh, put into my automobile. Um, the poor person who might really need that corn to eat uh, doesn't have the amount of money uh, and uh, really is not going to be an effective competitor to me uh, in the trade-off between food and fuel. So you have to understand these cost-benefit trade-offs within uh, the variety of the, the, within the context of the rules that are in place. These include secure property rights, they include certain personal protections from harm and threat, uh, and they also include uh, protection of basic liberties, and these would include things like free speech, assembly, and liberty of conscience. So we think of these notions as being protected not or being achieved not through kind of cost-benefit trade-offs, but as being protected by fundamental rights. So one of the primary jobs in ethics, as you think of it in the industrial vein, uh, is we have to get a good grip on what kind of ethics have to be in place before this kind of trade-off uh, efficiency uh, can really start to take place. Um, generally speaking, uh, industrial processes that impose costs on others uh, without their consent uh, are going to not reflect the true cost. So we're interested in developing a set of uh, rights and duties uh, that are going to constrain this. Now, what are the examples, right? I mean, pesticides are a great example, right? We get lower overall production costs, we get lower storage costs, uh, we get some lower reduction in the processing costs. All of these things that bring down costs uh, are a good thing, uh, starts to look like this is a winner. But certain pesticides in particular can impose health costs particularly on farm workers, the farm workers that are implying them, uh, and they can also impose costs on certain vulnerable consumers, especially uh, children and the immune deficiency. And so we understand that as a violation of their rights, and we, in fact, uh, have a, a law. Uh, this is one of my favorite laws to say. Uh, it's the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, or FIFRA, as we like to say. Um, but basically it works by uh, constraining the, uh, the pesticides that are actually considered to be acceptable, uh, largely according to this kind of a principle. So lower costs to do a chemical, due to chemical pesticides are not considered to offset uh, the damages that they do because these damages are especially important morally. Uh, they violate people's rights. Now I want to come back and emphasize the point that what I've been talking about is a framework for thinking about agriculture. It's a philosophy of agriculture. It's not a rationalization or justification for conventional agriculture uh, as it's currently practiced. And in fact, I would actually suggest that this framework provides a sketch of some of the work that really needs to be done within food ethics. It actually provides a way uh, for thinking critically uh, about agriculture. Now, if I come back to my picture of all of the various goods out there, we can just pick this uh, uh, safety sector uh, circle uh, as uh, a good place to start. And uh, we might want to say uh, that the reason we have food safety laws uh, is that we don't want to uh, increase efficiencies within agricultural production by um, producing unsafe foods. Uh, one of the basic uh, rights that has to be protected uh, is the right uh, to uh, eat safe food. Uh, once we have that protection in place, uh, then we can actually go forward and uh, look at some things that uh, would uh, start to promote efficiencies. And here we might actually understand uh, the efficiencies as part of the, uh, the thing that really addresses uh, the question of justice. Now you may be scratching your head. How does that happen? Uh, well, if uh, people would um, uh, only pay more uh, in order to assure, to people pay more in order to assure that their food tastes good, if they would only pay more uh, in order to assure that uh, we had foods coming from local farm economies, if they would pay more in order to sure, ensure that we had uh, a just wage going to farmers and wage workers, uh, then we could actually uh, 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 incorporate our notions of justice into this notion of efficiency. It becomes just a notion of saying, give the people what they want. Uh, the ethical burden here falls on us as consumers to demand uh, an agriculture uh, that meets uh, these kinds of uh, criteria. 
Uh, and indeed, uh, this is sometimes uh, the way that it's talked about. Uh, another way to look at this is to say, well, I don't like this idea of uh, ethics just coming down to being something like, is food tasty, right? Uh, whether or not uh, you're fair to farm workers and uh, others is, uh, is morally significant in a different way. And we need to make justice uh, more central. Uh, and uh, in particular, we might need to be making justice more central with respect to those people that don't get enough food. Uh, and in this way of thinking, we might want to add a third principle, uh, which is that there are certain basic rights uh, that uh, basic needs that have to be satisfied by right. So people would have a right to food, uh, being a talked about a right to food in India, uh, something that's guaranteed as a principle of public policy. Uh, and here we actually have uh, a, a somewhat of a tension between the idea that we uh, satisfy the needs of justice through our efficient operation of, uh, of markets on the one hand and our uh, idea that we should uh, really single out certain needs that people have uh, and protect those in much the same way that we protect rights like freedom of speech or not harming people through producing um, unsafe foods. Um, it's probably worth noticing uh, that this picture of the way that we understand competing ethical visions is actually pretty familiar. This is uh, very much the kind of debate that we're having over health care today. Uh, it's a debate that we have had uh, with respect to uh, other aspects of the industrial economy. Uh, and that's part of the reason that I call this an industrial philosophy of agriculture. We reproduce a tension between uh, addressing important ethical questions through um, market mechanisms and notions of efficiency uh, as opposed to notions of rights. Uh, and we often find ourselves uh, divided politically uh, in terms of people who tend to see uh, these, ethical, uh, these ethical conflicts in one way uh, rather than another. So we can come back to this industrial philosophy and move through a lot of questions about agriculture and see them uh, actually being quite meaningfully debated uh, through this, the lens of this industrial philosophy. Um, have indust existing agricultural production systems lived up to these norms and ideals of an industrial philosophy? Uh, we might be interested in whether or not the poor have really benefited uh, for systems of, uh, from efficiencies or whether or not we need some sort of an additional legal mechanism, some sort of policy mechanism uh, that would respect their, fright, their, their rights. And if we're interested in poor people today, what about future generations? We are expending uh, soil and water resources today uh, that future generations might need. Uh, if we're going to be concerned about the rights of poor people today, what about uh, people who are going to live in the future? Uh, it also provides a way to ask very different kinds of uh, new ethical questions. Uh, and uh, many people are asking this question, should we think about animals? Uh, as having rights? Uh, should we extend moral consideration uh, to farm animals when we think about where it's appropriate to impose costs uh, or not? Uh, is it even useful to think of biodiversity, uh, given Carrie Fowler's talk on biodiversity? Is it useful to think about uh, biodiversity and ecosystems uh, as having a kind of intrinsic value that needs to be shielded from some of these uh, efficiency-seeking uh, mechanisms? Now, I think these are all uh, very meaningful and important questions, and I actually spend a fair of my time uh, in terms of my own research and writing and in terms of my teaching on ethics and agriculture diving into the details of these questions. Uh, but what I want to do today is to actually uh, close off this part, this discussion of what I'm calling an industrial philosophy of agriculture, uh, and to move on. Oops, I have one more set of, uh, of questions. Uh, this is just repeating that they're industrial questions. I want to really move on to uh, a second set of philosophies of agriculture. Uh, before I do that, I'll emphasize this point that many of the criticisms that are made of agriculture, that it doesn't meet the needs of the hungry, that it doesn't address the uh, needs of animals, that it doesn't address needs of future generations, uh, these are all questions that are perfectly compatible with an industrial philosophy of agriculture. Uh, and that in many respects the industrial philosophy, that agriculture is just like any other sector of an industrial economy, it needs to live up to what we expect out of an industrial economy, uh, is actually a very good philosophical way to frame those questions. But it's not the only way to think about agriculture. And what I want to stress here for the next few minutes 
uh, is that there historically have been very different ways uh, to think about agriculture. Uh, and I want to do this by telling some stories. In agrarian philosophies of agriculture, farming and food ways uh, really are understood to draw upon uh, place, upon things that are regionally significant. Uh, they um, play an important role in fixing the character and the moral identity uh, of the people that live at that place. And in this framework, agriculture is not understood as just another sector of the industrial economy. Uh, Food and farming really uh, demand a very different type of moral conversation, one that uh, uh, is not so much focused on uh, the, the notions of uh, choosing uh, our values in a particular fashion. So let me, um, let me tell two stories. Um, one of them is a story about uh, ancient Greece, uh, and the other is a, a story about uh, the history of the United States. And as I tell these stories, I want to admit that the story I'm going to tell you is not strictly true, okay? Um, but um, it's a good story. We'll start with ancient Greece. Xenophon and Aristotle, two uh, philosophers of ancient Greece. Uh, Xenophon uh, wrote probably the first book of uh, the philosophy of agriculture. It was a book that he titled Economics. Uh, but uh, what it is about is about uh, how you should farm and why farming uh, is important for the structure of society. And Aristotle echoed much of this in his philosophy, especially in the book uh, that he entitled Politics. Uh, we can get a sense of this story by actually looking at Greece and comparing it to Egypt. Uh, the agricultural system in Egypt was one of the most successful agricultural systems of all times. It uh, survived for 7,000 years. Uh, and uh, it basically worked because the, this is modern Egypt, but in the old days there wasn't a dam uh, right there where it says uh, Aswan, uh, and uh, the Nile would flood every year, and the floodwaters of the Nile would come down and flood uh, all of that uh, green area on the map, uh, and uh, the Egyptians became quite adept at both trapping and uh, capturing uh, some of that uh, flood water using systems that look very much like some of those that uh, Bina showed in her slide, uh, and then also um, taking advantage of the flush of nutrients or fertilizers uh, that came down uh, with the Nile at the same time. Now, in order to make that agricultural system work, it had to be centrally managed, it had to be centrally planned, and you had it, it took uh, massive armies of slaves uh, to uh, keep the water managed in the right way. It took a priesthood uh, to essentially tell the slaves what to do uh, and to monitor when things need to be done, uh, but it was essentially a very top-down system uh, with only a few people at the very top who had any understanding uh, of how this system worked or, or, or how it functioned or what needed to be done at a particular time and place uh, in order to make it work. In contrast to that, uh, Greece was, uh, and still is, uh, a mountainous region in which there were these uh, pockets of fertile areas uh, that were isolated from one another by uh, steep, rocky mountains. Uh, and what you tended to see in ancient Greece were uh, communities of uh, producers who would form in these pockets of fertile areas. Uh, and uh, unlike the massive irrigated agricultures of Egypt, uh, the farms in Greece uh, tended to look like this. They, they had some crops, they had some uh, uh, grasses, some wheats and um, uh, grassy uh, crops that would grow and that would be planted every year. Uh, they also had some vine crops, they had uh, grapes, uh, and then they also had uh, olives, uh, and so they, they were planting these uh, tree and vine crops uh, that actually uh, you don't plant every year, important thing to know. Uh, you, uh, these are essentially lifetime investments for a farmer. Uh, and then, of course, they had a few uh, animals that uh, uh, would be on the farm uh, with them. Now, one of the things that was significantly different be between Greek agriculture and Egyptian agriculture uh, was that it could be managed uh, by a single family. Uh, actually, the Greek family didn't look like that. It looked more like that. Um, <clears throat> And uh, the, uh, the family would basically run uh, all of the farming operations. Now, I want to, in, in full honesty, they had some slaves uh, that helped them, although in the Greek system, uh, they, these would not be, certainly not massive armies of slaves. Uh, the typical Greek household farm would have one, two, or three slaves at most. 
uh, and they would be doing work uh, on a year-round basis. One of the things that tree and vine crops do to an operation is that they give you something to do all year round. And so the Greeks were able, with a fairly small work household unit, uh, to stay busy all year with the farming operation uh, and to have uh, a number of complementarities uh, in terms of the, the things that they were able to do. Now there are other aspects of Greek civilization. One of them is that there were these communities of farmers like this. Uh, the Greek term for them is the hoi masoi. Uh, the hoi poloi are the really rich people who live in the city, and the hoi masoi are the sort of uh, working class, salt of the earth people, but they're citizens, and they, the, they at least the, the male household head was a citizen, and he would go into the uh, city-state, uh, the uh, community uh, nearest to his farm, uh, and would be participating in various kinds of uh, community decision-making. Some of these were uh, kingdoms and some of them were democracies, uh, but in all cases, uh, the head of the household was very involved in um, the politics of the state, uh, and the politics of the state uh, were often very much focused on uh, the possibility that they were going to get invaded by somebody else, right? Uh, so uh, if you're a farmer and you have uh, your grain crop and somebody invades you, they burn it down or they cut it up, and it's tough for a year, but then you go out and plant it again next year and things get better. However, if you're a farmer and you have trees and vines and these invading herd, hordes come in and cut down your trees and your vines, you've lost a lifetime of labor. Uh, so these Greek farmers, unlike Egyptian slaves or even the Egyptian priesthood, uh, had an intense interest in protecting their land. Uh, and this bound them together as a community and it created uh, a unique form of military governance in ancient Greece uh, in which the head of the household would get dressed up like this and then he would engage in uh, a unique military form known as the phalanx. And the phalanx was successful because all of those people were farmers. They were all neighbors. They all knew one another. They knew that they could count on one another uh, to the last, last, uh, uh, last breath, uh, to the last ounce of blood. Uh, and so they were able to uh, be the most successful military force uh, of the ancient world. Um, the idea here is that uh, the form of agriculture uh, cultivates not only a sense of belonging to a community, a sense of citizenship, but it actually under, underlies uh, notions of patriotism and notions of courage uh, that were unique uh, in the ancient world, unique uh, to Greece. All of the city-states shared in this form, uh, but uh, unique uh, in, on, the, on the Greek uh, peninsula. So, we have a whole set of virtues that are in some sense uh, related to uh, the agriculture that's getting produced uh, in ancient Greek uh, and uh, uh, agriculture's not just producing a commodity, uh, it actually is binding the society together and it's giving Greek society the unique characteristics, the things that make Greek society uh, into uh, something that's not only important to the Greeks but that's historically important as one of the first societies in history uh, to give rise to notions of citizenship, participation, uh, and uh, uh, notions of uh, courage, uh, friendship, uh, and patriotism. So let me come back and tell my other uh, agrarian story. I'll try to tell this one a little more quickly. So um, Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton, and the Louisiana Purchase. Now, uh, most people know that Jefferson uh, praised farmers. He called them uh, the most virtuous citizens. Uh, but many people have uh, only know a part of this story. Uh, Jefferson's praise of farmers uh, was uh, very specific to a particular debate uh, that was going on in the early republic. Uh, and it's most, uh, perhaps most uh, graphically uh, depicted by a debate between Jefferson and Hamilton, who were both uh, within the uh, administration of uh, Washington. And there was a debate going on about how to take the limited resources that the New Republic had uh, and uh, invest them wisely uh, so that the country would grow. And Hamilton had a vision that emphasized investing in textile mills in New Jersey. Uh, Hamilton's vision of the new country would be uh, that we would uh, build some factories, we would uh, have economic growth, we'd have jobs, uh, but then we'd also have uh, a class of, uh, of owners 
uh, who would be relied upon for uh, the primary leadership of the country. Hamilton envisioned the United States as functioning very much like England did at the time, and at that time, uh, all of the power uh, was uh, resided in the House of Lords. Uh, the House of Lords uh, had the power because people felt that uh, uh, people who had uh, titles and who had uh, 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 lands and who were the industrial leaders of the society uh, were the people whose interests were really most closely tied uh, to um, making the country go. They would uh, naturally be uh, the most uh, uh, responsible people, uh, and they were the people that you really needed to uh, rest your government on. Now, Jefferson had a very different vision. We might call it an agrarian vision, but that's actually, that's actually my agrarian vision, so I'll end the shameless promotion. Jefferson's vision looked a little more like this. It looked a little bit, quite a bit like the, the Greek farms. Jefferson's vision was that uh, uh, if you, there's something right about this argument that, that Hamilton and the Federalists are making, that, that you know, Jefferson saw that manufacturers and traders uh, were leaving, right? You know, during the revolutionary years and during the tough times, uh, you know, they were heading off to the Caribbean where the British were still in charge or heading up to Canada where the British were still in charge. And, you know, they had interests that were quite portable and could be moved around. Uh, but the farmers can't move, right? The farmers are stuck there. And so farmers, because they invest their lives into their land, uh, are more valuable as citizens. And that's, in fact, what Jefferson wrote. Uh, he didn't think that they were just more morally better people. Uh, uh, Jefferson was a farmer, and he had some pretty scurrilous neighbors, uh, and he knew that uh, there were some farmers he couldn't particularly trust. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, they had to stick it out, and they had to uh, function as uh, citizens. And I actually want to read one uh, brief uh, quote from, from Jefferson uh, that uh, um, uh, articulates this. Um, first, this is not Jefferson, but the mob rule that had been feared by Hamilton and linked with the French reign of terror was associated with urban industrial workers who not only were vulnerable to the vicissitudes of economic boom and bust, but also constituted a ready source of street protests and violent uprisings when employment was short. Jefferson argued that it was better to keep the working classes employed on the farm where their labors would at least ensure them something to eat and where there would be less opportunity for spontaneous rioting. He made this argument initially in his book, Notes on the State of Virginia, uh, where he wrote, and here is the quote, it is better to carry provisions and materials to workmen in Europe than to bring them to the, than to bring them to the provisions and materials and with them their manners and principles. The mobs of great cities add just so much to the support of pure government as do sores to the strength of the human body. It is the manners and spirit of a people which preserve a republic in vigor. A degeneracy in these is a canker which soon eats to the heart of its laws and customs. Now, what's going on here from an ethics standpoint? I want to just suggest at this point that we actually have a philosophical approach that works quite differently from the logic of making choices and protecting choices with rights and achieving efficiencies uh, that we come to associate with debates over uh, intellectual, po over uh, industrial politics. Uh, what we have here is an ethics that doesn't focus so much on the choices that people make, but on the character that they develop. It's an ethics of habits. What you do is you, it's, it's not so much an, an ethic of thinking, I've got to be a better person. It's an ethic of thinking, how can we arrange things so that people will naturally be better people? Uh, it's an ethic that is somewhat indirect. It's not an ethic of conscience, oh, I've got to be better, I've got to, I've got to make good choices, right? Uh, it's an ethic of creating the environment in which uh, the habits and character, philosophers would say, the virtues that we want to encourage uh, in a people uh, come to the surface, come to arise naturally. It's, and this is done uh, through uh, the most basic material uh, aspects of your society, through the way that you uh, produce yourselves and reproduce your people uh, in the case of both ancient Greece and early America uh, in terms of the agriculture. What's happening in this is that you're producing a certain moral identity. You're producing characteristic habits, dispositions, and tastes. Uh, this is being done through material practices that reproduce certain customs and habits 
uh, and uh, it emphasizes uh, traditions and recurring reciprocities. It's important that you're doing this with a set of neighbors, as in ancient Greece, Greek society. It's important that you know all of those other people who are there in the phalanx with you, that they're all uh, people that uh, you trust intimately uh, and that uh, you will continue to interact with uh, throughout your lifetime. Uh, and what uh, gets emphasized in this kind of an ethic, uh, rather than notions of choice, notions of rights, notions of efficient outcomes, are notions like moral character and community. So this kind of summarizes some of the ideas behind an agrarian ethic that uh, uh, what you're producing is a, a notion of community identity. Uh, it's, often, uh, circa, uh, circa, it's often tied to a particular place uh, and it's something that is uh, embodied often in the traditions of a people. Um, I've got a couple of slides and I'm running a little long so I'm gonna move right on. Um, is any of this relevant to us today, right? I mean, we're not fighting the invading hordes in phalanxes, uh, and uh, we're long past the idea uh, where we could count on um, citizenship uh, because most of our citizens are farmers. Uh, here's a couple of uh, attempts to rehabilitate an ethic, uh, agrarian ethic. One of them uh, is uh, due to the work of an um, anthropologist named Walter Goldschmidt, who studied two farming communities in California in the late 1940s. Uh, and he noticed that uh, the farming community that was surrounded by a relatively few large farms uh, had a much weaker social institutions and much weaker sense of uh, community identity and subsequently much lower quality of life, despite the fact that the farmers were much better off than did another farming community that was surrounded by uh, smaller, uh, more medium-sized uh, uh, farms. Uh, so this has given rise to a theme uh, that uh, is, uh, continues to be debated, I think, in rural communities, uh, and I think is at the heart of the small farm, uh, large farm debate. It's not that large farms are inherently uh, worse or, in, or that you get sort of you know, evil people out of large farms, but the idea is that uh, uh, these communities that are surrounded by a number of smaller farms uh, have more community coherence and people are much more invested in one another on uh, an egalitarian basis. Um, this, I think, will continue to be a debate uh, that's important in rural America, but increasingly larger and larger sections of our country uh, have very little contact uh, with rural America. So I think even this agrarian vision uh, as important as it may be even in communities like St. Peter, uh, may be less important to people who are living in major metropolitan areas. And here I'd call attention to the work of uh, Tom Lyson, who wrote this very nice book, uh, Civic Agriculture. And Tom's suggestion was that uh, by emphasizing food practices, by emphasizing eating together, by coming to understand where our food comes from, uh, we can perhaps recapture uh, some of this sense of community identity and community spirit uh, that uh, can have a meaning even for people who live in, in cities. Uh, in a certain sense, the agrarian stories that I tell may be more important as stories. They may be more important as uh, ways in which we can understand the sense in which we might uh, be bound together in a community and depend on one another uh, than actually replicating an agricultural structure uh, that look, looks like this. Uh, the, agri the civic agriculture vision uh, has to do with who we are, how we understand ourselves as a we. So I'm going to wrap up here quickly, and I, I have to uh, uh, offer a really quick uh, disclaimer. Um, you know, there are these agrarian stories, part of the part I didn't tell is there are slaves in both of these stories, right? Uh, and in, uh, particularly in Xenophon's uh, philosophy of agriculture, uh, women are, uh, Xenophon has uh, terrible things to say about women. I mean, you know, he clearly didn't think that they uh, were smart enough uh, to run a farm. And uh, uh, Xenophon's agrarian story, uh, to the extent that it gets taken too seriously, becomes a source uh, for continuing to uh, disvalue and even repress uh, women. So uh, I don't want for a second to be uh, understood as suggesting that we need to go back to some kind of agrarian vision of the vast. Uh, these agrarian visions uh, need to be rehabilitated, they need to be rethought, uh, perhaps looking at them uh, in terms of, uh, of, uh, of food ethics, ways in which we could work uh, through food communities. 
The message that I want to conclude with, though, is that I actually think we need both of these philosophies of agriculture. One of the places where we're going to get the moral questions and be able to raise the important critical questions about our agriculture and our food system is precisely through the language of making choices, um, uh, achieving efficiencies, uh, and asking, you know, well, are, are the important rights that uh, have to be met uh, in place as we do that? Uh, but we don't want to lose, and I, I think we are at risk of losing, a moral vocabulary uh, that speaks to habits, that speaks to character, that speaks to questions such as who are we as a community? What is it that really uh, binds us together as a community? And so one of the reasons why I really want to uh, bring some sense of agrarian thinking back, even if we have to revise it and rethinking, is that it's a way of speaking ethically uh, that bring, emphasizes uh, the notion of community and the notion of uh, ethics as informing our material practices, things that we're not thinking about, things that we're not making choices about, uh, but that are indirectly uh, influencing much of what we do. And uh, so my concluding thought, ethics isn't a set of rules, uh, it's an activity. It's something that we do together. Thank you. Shall we, shall we begin? First, I wonder if there are questions from our panelists. Any questions for Paul from our panelists? Yes, please, Francis. Paul, I loved your presentation. I found it fascinating. And I have a really big question <laughs> because... Um, I'm nervous. Okay, well, it's, it's big in my life. So here's the thought. Do you see and forgive me if I missed it, but it seems as if there is a prior sort of foundational um, issue, ethical issue, which is who is enabled to participate in weighing any of these profound choices, mm -hmm. and how are we enabled or shut out of that discussion, yes. choosing between visions or all of those dozens of right. issues you raised. And that's kind of underneath it all to me. Well, I actually think that one of the things that can be said for what I call the industrial vision is that it, 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 it's asking those questions about rights are ways to raise those questions about participation. The question of, you know, who, is, who has rights, who's affected, uh, it, it, it's equally important and actually maybe in some respects more important to ask who gets to participate in the process. And I think one of the uh, one of the the, the clear I, it's almost insulting to call it a weakness, but blindnesses in uh, the agrarian tradition is that those questions were not raised, and agrarian systems uh, tended to be uh, very exclusionary, and they tended to although it's it's good that they reproduced a certain order, they tended to reproduce a very narrow and exclusive social order. Uh, the Greek society was, uh, in comparison to Egypt, uh, you know, open, but it was hardly an open society. Uh, so I think that uh, it, it becomes really uh, critical, and it's one of the, the reasons why I don't really say that I'm not really an agrarian, uh, but I do feel that we're now at a point in our history where uh, we have, uh, in fact, uh, started to come to grips with those questions, and it's important not to lose this component of our moral vocabulary, that uh, the, the underlying material practices uh, uh, inform us and give us a sense of community identity. Uh, but I think that uh, um, certainly in terms of, of women, of uh, poor people, of excluded parties, uh, it's absolutely critical uh, to have a, a, a moral vocabulary, a set of ethical concepts uh, that allows you to uh, press those questions. So I hope, um, I hope that uh, I, I am agreeing with you that there is a, a prior uh, um, uh, question, uh, which is that uh, things need to be opened up and uh, there, there needs to be an opportunity for everyone to participate. Pina? Um, you know, this was such an interesting lecture and it, it triggered so many different thoughts. 
um, that we need to reflect on. Um, but one of those was um, that, you know, we've talked a lot about food as output, as things that we consume, um, how we cook them, how we eat, and so on. But this brings us back to um, farming as an activity mm -hmm. beyond what is actually produced. And the way in which that activity is organized makes a critical difference to our sense of community. So when you talk about small farms uh, as being important, uh, I talked about small farms as well. Um, and it is within small farms, you can actually participate, communicate, and build networks. And we know that networks are key to both a sense of community and a sense of citizenship. Mm -hmm. Uh, and during uh, uh, you know, the, the lunch break, uh, one of the students asked me, does cooperatives, do cooperatives lead to more unity in the country? And I said, well, I'm not sure, I don't have an answer, but I would certainly think that, uh, I would hypothesize that if there was more sense of community, there would be more sense of unity mm -hmm. and less of a sense of self-interest and perhaps more of a sense of other regarding. And that is perhaps absolutely critical for the future of our planet, if one might use such a large phrase, that unless we are other regarding, both mm -hmm. for our neighbors and other countries and for the future, we can't survive. Right. So I, that, I, that really has... Well, thank you. That's uh, certainly uh, the, very much the kind of uh, point that I want to make and that I wanted to emphasize. And I think in some respects the, the question that we face, and I, hear this, I think this is an open question. I don't think any of us have the answer. We, we have these models where we understand farming is an activity uh, that builds community and that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, creates a sense of uh, unity and moral identity. Uh, can we actually uh, imagine food practices? Can we imagine uh, ways of cooking, eating, sharing food uh, in, in ways that would also be understood as activities, right? So it's not just uh, the, 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 what it tastes like. It's not just is it healthy. Uh, it's not these kinds of uh, endpoints that clearly those are all important and they're important. Um, uh, we, we, I don't want to say that they're less important, but we need not to lose sight of the fact that when we cook, when we prepare food, when we obtain food, whether it's shopping or uh, picking up a share from the CSA, we're doing something and this activity is the very stuff of what our lives consist in. Yes. Uh, what we are is what we do. And if we can do that in ways uh, that uh, uh, pull us together, give us a sense of, uh, of being a people, uh, that, uh, or at least understand that that is one of the dimensions of a food system, I think we'll have a much richer uh, and hopefully uh, more fruitful co conversation about yes. food. Yes, definitely. I'll turn to some questions now from the audience. Uh, and there are so many, and I'm sort of paralyzed because they're so interesting, but let's see. To what extent um, do the agrarian and industrial philosophies of agriculture contribute to the practice or philosophy of war making? Ah, that's a good one. Um, I can certainly tell you that uh, uh, war making has contributed to uh, the success of industrial agriculture. Um, and uh, it, it's a very interesting story. Um, uh, one of the, I, I think it's an important story that needs to be told because uh, when we look at uh, modes of farming today that look like they're quite efficient, uh, it's important to know that those probably would not have evolved or happened had it not been for the fact uh, that we had two world wars. Uh, in uh, the first world war, uh, it became very important to make uh, bombs and bullets. And what we did is we massively subsidized our ability to produce synthetic nitrogen. And after the war, we had this massive plant, massive capability to produce synthetic nitrogen, and what did we want to do with it? Well, one of the things that was very cheap to do once you've actually built the capacity is to start using it for nitrogen fertilizer. Uh, and so the idea that somehow uh, the style of farming that we have today uh, is more efficient 
uh, needs to be, we need to take into consideration that a major part of the reason it seems cheaper today uh, is because we subsidized a lot of those costs uh, in, in, in fighting a war. Uh, what did we do in the Second World War? Well, most of the pesticide technologies we have today are war technologies. Most of the initial research and development of the manufacturing capacity for using those technologies came out of the war. Uh, so uh, I, I think that there is, uh, if not a, um, uh, a deep philosophical connection, uh, there are ways in which uh, our history of making wars, and I'm not suggesting we shouldn't have fought those wars, uh, but uh, can really skew our understanding of what is an efficiency in agriculture. Mm -hmm. And when we add the uh, interstate system to that, yes. we have another layer. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of questions are asking about other <coughs> elements, uh, other philosophical elements we might add to this discussion. For instance, Eastern philosophies or Native American philosophies, do they weave into the agrarian story? Well, that's a great question, and it's one that I, I, I await uh, enlightenment <laughs> from others. Uh, but I, fortunately, I have a, a brand new colleague at Michigan State who's a Native American and works primarily in, in environmental justice. And uh, uh, I prevailed upon him to uh, read my book and think about this. And, uh, and uh, you know, he, he, and actually what he was doing is uh, there's already been one comment written uh, uh, basically uh, saying that I'm too close to these agrarians, right? The agrarians are all sexist and they're all racist and uh, we need to be paying much more attention to people's rights. And uh, what my colleague says is that the, the thing that that misses is that today the tribes are the agrarians. <laughs> <laughs> that this is essentially how they think of agriculture. Mm -hmm. They have very much have agrarian views, and they might not articulate it in the same way that Jefferson did, uh, but that uh, this actually becomes a vocabulary uh, that is actually quite amenable to Native American ways of thinking about uh, agriculture. So I say that not as something coming from me, but as mm -hmm. some point, some, some, something coming from uh, someone that has, in fact, uh, studied those, uh, those tribal systems mm -hmm. very carefully. Okay. Thanks. Uh, how do you think about and deal with externalities to consumption? For example, do consumers have a right to endless growth in the number of cars, highways, connections, and um, sizes, um, and the freedom to choose how much and where to drive? Well, one of the reasons why I really uh, emphasize this agrarian tradition, which I think is declining to the point where it's almost disappeared uh, from our moral vocabulary, is that I would not so much oppose uh, the, the notion of uh, a right to consume as I would want to oppose the idea that rights talk is Trump for everything, right? Mm -hmm. And that in some sense we get to a point. I don't know where that point is. It's a point that we discover through dialogue and conversation uh, where our need to have a sense of togetherness, our need to sense to be part of a community, uh, really needs to constrain um, our emphasis on rights and our emphasis on trade-offs. And um, I think we've reached that point in our social development today, uh, and I hope that we can start to recover uh, some of the, the ways of thinking that I think were, in fact, quite commonplace 200 years ago. Would you, here's a question from a different um, sphere of thought. Would you care to comment on the ethics of food and communion, the ethics of agriculture and the theology of Jesus as the first fruits of God's new creation, or um, this is a quotation from Revelation, or of those who have been slain who cry out from under the altar for justice. So can you make any connections between these spheres? Well, I think that, and one of the things that's in my book is a, a, a chapter on food and community where uh, I talk about the way that uh, uh, we might understand uh, this notion of uh, you are what you eat as uh, a source of community when in fact we eat the same thing. Um, in that, I, would, I, I go on to say that uh, this is a very powerful uh, message and a very powerful metaphor. It can pull us together. And I think that this is part of the meaning of communion in the Christian tradition. But the other thing that I would say, uh, and I've said this, I think, before in different ways, is that that metaphor can uh, divide at the same time that it unites. Uh, and that uh, one of the reasons why I... Uh, I, I love it as a metaphor, uh, but don't love it as literal truth, uh, is that it, uh, you, you reach a point where if you're not 
uh, part of a particular spiritual tradition, uh, you're automatically excluded from the, from the community. I don't think that's uh, consistent with uh, Jesus' message or with the spirit of Christianity. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, let's see, a question about energy that just disappeared the way energy always does when you're looking <laughs> for it, right? Um, I was surprised that you did not include energy in your group of relevant circles, yeah. namely three units of energy to produce one human unit of energy for eggs, let alone meat. Um, so would you care to comment on what kind of a circle energy would be? Yeah, it's a good place. It could be another uh, circle. Uh, it could be, and I don't, I, I don't mean to suggest that the circles I got up there uh, would be a complete inventory. Um, I, I think that uh, the energy question uh, is an absolutely critical question, and we, it's, it's, we've hit it a couple of times in a couple of the talks. Uh, it's a question uh, that uh, uh, I think, again, needs to be addressed squarely from an industrial perspective. In many respects, uh, questions about the efficient use of energy and questions about whose rights are affected when we uh, compute efficiencies for energy are absolutely critical moral questions and uh, the, the, the tools of the, agrarian, of the industrial philosophy sharpen those questions in a really important way. It's another reason why I'm not an agrarian. At the same time, uh, I think that uh, it's important uh, not to lose sight of the fact that, uh, and to think a little bit about how uh, ways of configuring energy use uh, might be important in a community sense. And in a, in a paper that's not included in the book, I've actually made the comment on biofuels that uh, while I can understand how we might uh, understand food as a basis for community, uh, it's difficult for me to imagine pulling up to the gas pump as a basis for community. It just doesn't really kind of resonate for me that way, but maybe that's my problem. Well, when you go in for the coffee, though. <laughs> <laughs> a number of questions ask um, about how we can participate in, I guess, being connected to this agrarian philosophy, and let me just give you kind of a pastiche of them. Uh, given that the American brand of life is characterized by great separation. I didn't mean pastiche, I meant something more like deep and rich melange. Um, <laughs> between American people and the consequences of their lives, how does that separation create challenges for pursuing ethical and good food policies? Um, a question, how do urbanites support an ethic of agriculture shy of becoming farmers? Um, how do we view um, the cost of things like clean air, clean water, and so on, not as costs that farmers need to internalize, but as benefits that we all need to pay for. So can you speak to the matter of how do we participate? So uh, these are great questions, and, and um, I think that we, we, need to we need to be talking about these things. I mean, uh, what I envision um, ethics as, I, I, I close with the idea that this is an activity. It's a conversation, it's an argument. Um, but uh, it is an activity that we engage in and that we learn from one another uh, when we engage in it. Some of these questions, and I think uh, you know, some of those that right at the end uh, are, are great questions that uh, an industrial vision where we're focusing on making choices, we're focusing on whose rights are affected, uh, and we're focusing on our efficiencies, they bring those questions right into focus, mm -hmm. and that's the way that we need to go. Uh, but other questions, these questions about what kind of people would we really like to be, right? Um, not what are my tastes and preferences today, but what kind of person would I really like to be? What would I like my children to be like? What would I like uh, uh, the society look, to look like seven generations from now? These are questions that uh, an agrarian mode of thinking, uh, a mode of thinking that's much more focused on our habits and our character, are much more capable of articulating. So part of my message is that uh, I do think that as a society, uh, we have uh, tended to push that mode of thinking and that mode of talking uh, out. It's, it's, it's no longer considered to be fair to even talk uh, in a language of virtues. You almost get laughed out of the room if you start talking about virtues, right? Um, and we need to bring that back. We need to make that part of the conversation, uh, and that needs to be an okay thing to talk about, and we need to be engaging in that aspect of our, our moral lives as well. Thanks. One last question. You began with an inventory of good food. Are the marks of good food the same for an industrial philosophy and the agrarian options to it, or are they different? Yeah, that's a good question, and it's central, and I think that uh, uh, they are different. I think that, that, that in many respects, 
uh, what is good food in an agrarian model uh, is food that, uh, uh, without so much thinking about it, without making choices, without uh, uh, debating uh, things, uh, brings us uh, into a spirit of togetherness, brings us together with one another, uh, and creates uh, a set of habits that uh, are respectful of the environment, are respectful of other people, are respectful of, of uh, animals. I'm thinking about eating foods that are in season, uh, for example, as one of the kinds of habits that can do that. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, you do get, um, perhaps all of the circles are there for either philosophy, but I think they resonate in different ways. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Well, thank you all, and I remind you that 7.30-ish tonight, um, Frances Moore LePay will be speaking in uh, that building right over there, and you can hear her in the Heritage Room in Overflow if you are not attending the banquet. Thanks so much. We'll see you there.